You are listening to The Catholic Wire. Welcome back to episode two of What Every Catholic Should Know. We're continuing our discussion of the Baltimore Catechism number three. This is your host, Brother Alexius, and I'm joined again by Father Zapeda. Father, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me here. Okay, so let's go right into uh, chapter number two of the Baltimore Catechism number three. I'll read the questions and... Uh, You'll supply the answers, and then we'll talk about them. Awesome. So, question number 162. What is a perfection? A perfection is any good quality a thing should have. A thing is perfect when it has all the good qualities it should have. And I guess I should have stated first, too, that this is lesson two on God and his perfections. Yes. So, next question. What is God? God is a spirit infinitely perfect. What do we mean when we say that God is infinitely perfect? When we say that, we mean that there are, there are no limits or bounds to his perfection, for he possesses all good qualities in the highest possible degree, and he alone is infinitely perfect. Had God a beginning? No, God had no beginning. He always was, and he always will be. Where is God? God is everywhere. How is God everywhere? God is everywhere, whole and entire, as he is in any one place. This is true, and we must believe it, even if we cannot comprehend it. If God is everywhere, why do we not see him? We do not see God because he is a pure spirit and cannot be seen with bodily eyes. Why do we call God a pure spirit? We call God a pure spirit because he has no body. Our soul is a spirit, but not a pure spirit, because it was created for union with our body. Why can we not see God with the eyes of our body? We cannot see God with the eyes of our body because they are created to see only material things, and God is not material, but spiritual. Does God see us? God sees us and watches over us. Is it necessary for God to watch over us? Yes. It is necessary for God to watch over us, because without his constant care, we would not exist. Does God know all things? Yes, God knows all things, even our most secret thoughts, words, and actions. Can God do all things? Yes, God can do all things, and nothing is hard or impossible to him. When is a thing said to be impossible? A thing is said to be impossible when it cannot be done. Many things that are impossible for creatures are possible for God. Is God just, holy, and merciful? Yes, God is just. God is all just, all holy, all merciful, and he is infinitely perfect. Why must God be just as well as merciful? God must be just as well as merciful because he must fulfill his promise to punish those who merit punishment. And because he cannot be infinite in one perfection without being infinite in all of them. Into what sins will the forgetfulness of God's justice lead us? If we forget of God's justice, we will fall into sins of presumption. Into what sins will the forgiven forgetfulness of God's mercy lead us? And if we forget of God's mercy, we will fall into sins of despair. Okay, and that concludes this section of the book. Lesson two is a lot shorter than lesson one. Yes, indeed. So, Father, uh, what can you tell us about these these questions and answers? This is actually a very theological section. Uh, It covers God's perfections. It goes right into, you know, what God is or how God is. And it's very interesting, but it needs to be explained. Uh, First, you know, something I would like to mention first is this. Uh, we know that God is a spirit. You know, we are body and, and soul. So we have a spiritual side to us and we have a material side to us. God doesn't have a material side. He only has a spiritual nature. 
And the thing is, most of the times when we hear this, we think of that as, as something less, wrongly, mm -hmm. you know, but we think, oh, well, he's lacking something. That's not the case, actually, material Part, the material side is actually more imperfect, is limited. Uh, and that's why when we say God is a spirit, that alone is, is speaking of something superior to us. Our so, material side is, is actually inferior. It's something that is a limitation. God doesn't have that limitation. So he doesn't need a body to be perfect. Exactly, because a body is actually not something imperfect, but it's a nature that is inferior to the spiritual nature. The spiritual mm -hmm. nature is so much more unlimited, it's so much more powerful than the material one. So when we say that God is a spirit, we need to make sure that we understand that's a, a superior side. It's not that he is lacking something, is that actually that's way better than our material side. Mm. Another so point that, sorry, go ahead. In our materiality, are, are we lacking something? No, would but we be we more have, perfect if we were only spirits? We would, because the material, well, not as human beings. I mean, we were designed as human beings to be material and spiritual. But mm -hmm. what we need to realize is that the material side is limited, is more in, is, is inferior to the spiritual side. So actually, as creatures who have a material side, we are inferior to spiritual creatures. Mm. I'm, I'm not sure we can put an example to, to explain this because it's something that we might not find any similarities in, in, in nature as we know it. But um, basically that's, that's the concept. Material nature is limited by itself, by definition is limited. Right. And we will see this. We will see this as we cover this more. more. For example, let's start with the next part of the question, of a question, question 165. We, we hear of God that he has no beginning, that he always was and he always will be. Right. And this is often always misunderstood. Uh, it's hard to wrap your mind around. Exactly, because people think of this as, oh, so that means that God existed before and he will exist after. And that's not that's not actually, actually the concept. The concept is God is absolutely outside of time. Time is created as well. So we, we picture God in a timeline, and then creation is somewhere in that timeline, and then God was before that timeline, and then after that timeline, and that's a wrong way to understand it. The timeline itself is created, so God is totally outside of the timeline. For him, there is no time. There's no after, mm -hmm. there's no before. So we understand things in time frame. God doesn't have that frame. So here's another concept, you know, where we see material, materiality, as a limited thing. There is a conception, there is an extension, there is a limit, a beginning and an end. God doesn't even have that dimension. He doesn't have the time dimension because it, that's, that itself is a limit. God doesn't have that limit. God is totally outside of time. Not only that, God created time. It can be hard sometimes, I think, for people to uh, imagine that you can have a personal relationship with a being who doesn't exist in time you know because for for us everything the way that we interact with with other beings is all so linear it's you know i do this and then they do that it's hard to imagine a relationship that transcends that well here's the thing i mean i would rephrase that god does exist in time but not because he's limited by time god god puts himself so to speak in, in his creation he's there as well He's in, in time relative to us. Exactly. So, for example, God can acts kind of like a father, not kind of. He acts like a father, and he comes down to our level. That's why in the Bible, if you read the Bible, the Old Testament, you will see God reacting. You know, you will see that man does, does something, and God seems to react to that. He, mm -hmm. he responds to that. That's not because God is seeing things in a time frame. It sometimes even seems like God is surprised or like like when he's going through the Garden of Eden and he is looking for Adam. And then he mm -hmm. says, where where have you been? Why are you hiding from me? Exactly. They, they, uh, in the Holy Scripture puts God in a way that we can understand him. And because mm -hmm. that's that's how God acts with us. He bring, He comes down and he acts in our time frame or in our, our frame of existence because that's how he relates to us. So that's a, that's a very interesting point that you make, actually. We as human beings, we would not be able 
to communicate or to relate with him in, in his nature, in his infinite, beautiful, eternal nature. So right. he comes down to our level. He is the one that communicates with us. And that's why you have faith and revelation where God is the one that needs to come down to our level to talk to us and to interact with us. So uh, they tell us also God is everywhere and that we go here again to the spiritual nature, you know, because God is everywhere because he is a spirit. So now, is that true of all spirits then? Uh, it's only true of God, but uh, spirits are limited. This is uh, this. We would go here into a very, I guess, very, very deep theological questions, perhaps okay. beyond my my talents. But uh, I'll just say it like this. Angels, for example, are limited in the way that uh, their power, their action is limited to a certain place or to, to a certain time. Mm. Uh, God, God is not. God is present everywhere. That's like his prerogative. So an angel is not limited precisely uh, in the same way that we are, but he's limited in regards to where his influence is being taken, is taking place or where he is, he is actually present in his power. That's something that actually goes beyond my understanding. And I don't even know if, if we have a way to understand that in this material mm -hmm. way. But here's another thing where, you know, we tend to think of God in our spatial dimension we tend to think of god as 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 we are you know we are limited beings with a limited extension i only go so far i'm six we're feet. in a certain place yes right i'm six we have a relationship tall. to to place in general and to to the world mm -hmm. and we we have a certain extension in our body you know all, i only go so right. far i'm sure if you take my intestines and you spread them out they might go for a long time for a long you know extension but you know it's <laughs> only a certain extension and, and God, because he's a spirit and because he's an infinite spirit, he doesn't have that, that, that limitation. And that's mm -hmm. why that's why we say of God that he is holy in every single place. So we don't think of God as a huge spiritual being and like there are parts of him here and parts of him there. God is a whole spiritual being and every single place in every single place in earth and in the extension of the universe and everywhere. The God whole is God is in every fully, single place. Yes, fully present. And that's why that's why it's such a big deal when we commit sin, because mm. God is there in every single particle, in every single place, in every single time. God is fully there. So if, if we knew that, if we could remember that, it would make it very hard for us to commit a sin. And that's why we need to teach this in the catechism, you know, that God is truly everywhere. Yeah, that is a very important point. It's something that I think a lot of people overlook. I mean, yeah. even even with Catholics, we uh, we have the tendency to think of God, you know, in the Blessed Sacrament and in a soul in the state of grace, but not necessarily also in every particle of the universe. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, you just give an example here. You know, let's say that you're, for example, let's say a person is killing someone else. God is present there. God is mm -hmm. present there in you. He's present in that person. He's present in the knife. He's present everywhere. So uh, we will. This this would bring probably a lot of questions, and we will answer them in the future. But for example, we can simply say that God is present there, but He still let let us or leaves us to be free. So we go. If we keep going in the Catechism, it will tell us: Does God see us? Yes, He sees us, and He watches over us. And why is that necessary? Uh, God watches over us, and not only that, he sustains us in existence. And that's another point we never consider. You know, I remember, I think my mother would tell me, if God stopped thinking of you, if God stopped taking care of you, you would cease to exist immediately. So because you exist, were made out of nothing, right? Yes, and not only that, it's like uh, existence is not something that belongs to us. Mm. We exist. But the only the only being that has existence in its nature or actually is, is identical with its nature is God. So God is the only being that by essence exists. It's it, it's impossible for God not to exist. We are not like that. We by essence, we, we don't have to exist. I mean, I, I could exist and I could not exist. There was a time even when both of us did not exist. Exactly. So. 
Our existence, every second, every instant of our existence is being given to us by God. So he's constantly taking care of all creation, of all nature, of every ant, of every leaf, of every person, of every cell in your body. Even and, the and souls in hell, I guess, he's constantly imparting their existence to them. Even the souls in hell and even even the devil them, himself. Mm. Now, here's a, a question will come up, and I'm sure it will come up. Someone might say, well, how does God allow those things? Or why does God allow bad things to happen? Those those questions will come up, and, and we might have a chapter on that uh, to discuss it. It's a question a, a lot of people uh, ask these days. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I had so a story. One time I was uh, I was in Omaha, and I was the, the day after I was supposed to drive nine hours, mm. and this is like eleven o'clock, and one of the border nine? boys came. Yes, one of the border boys came over and he starts asking me questions, and this was the main gist of the questions: is like, why does God allow bad things to happen? And oh, you know, yeah. God is everywhere. This we went on for like Big two topic. hours. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is a big topic. We went on for like two or three hours because he had many, many questions about it. And I guess I can summarize it all in, in this. God created nature. God created angels. He created men. But the ma- God promised, so to speak, to give us freedom. One of God's intention was that we would be free. And the same thing went for angels. They also had freedom. And in order to preserve that freedom is that all these things have to be allowed. So it's not that God wants evil. It's not that God wants to cooperate with evil. But what God wants is our freedom to love and to to make the choice to love him. So he values freedom so much that for its sake, he's willing to allow all of the evil that exists. Exactly, because there is no other there's no other way that that would be impossible to not be there. So if a man needs to be free, he needs to have a choice. And if God is a good choice, then there has to be an opposite, which is an, which is an evil choice. Mm-hmm. And God is love. And so God created things out of love and for love. And so if one is to love, one needs to be free. This oh man, this this could go. Uh, very very long but that's that's the gist of the answer god allows these things to happen because one of the things one of the warranties one of the promises that he made so to speak is that we were going to be free and And for freedom to exist we need to have a choice and one thing you mentioned there is that god is love so in that he created us all out of love and gave us freedom out of love it's is it reasonable to expect that uh that god is going to be fair like he's not he he's because when people are are afraid of god's um when people accuse like people this argument comes up because people feel like like god has been unfair or unloving in allowing suffering but um But everything that that God has done is going to be perfectly fair, right? Exactly. That leads us actually to the next questions. And I just want to tell people we were not planning this question that brother just asked. It's just that, you know, he is that good at making questions. (laughs) (laughs) No, but it's true. Uh, um, Because God is fair and he's so good, then there must be those two factors that they mentioned here in the catechism. He has to be both just and merciful. They are two sides, so to speak, of the same coin. They are two sides of love, precisely. Mercy, no one would doubt that mercy is a part of love. You know, you're merciful, and so you, you that comes from love. God is merciful, and he, he tries to do as much, or he does as much good as he, as we allow him to do to us. You know, mm-hmm. um, and, and, whew, yeah, this is interesting. So we that, will that's cover... a big point, actually. God wants to do good to us, and it's is us that gets in the way. Exactly, we are the ones that don't allow it. To give an example, you know, all the evil that happens in the world—wars, disease, right. death, injustice—you know, rape, murder, stealing, theft, all that stuff—that mm-hmm. wasn't God's plan. God had made a creation, and we will cover this. God made creation in such a way that everything was supposed to be perfect. We were supposed to be happy. 
no one was supposed to suffer. Everyone was supposed to be, you know, smart, pretty, helpful. And that what sounds happened? good to me. It, it was, it was going to be really good. And, and, <laughs> and here's what happened. God had to give us a choice. Mm-hmm. Because the whole purpose of creation was love. So ha- God had to give us a choice to either be happy and love him or the opposite. But a choice had to be given because otherwise this would be just a creation of robots. We would be machines. There would be no point. There would be no real love. For us to actually love God, we had to have a choice. And that was a choice that was given to Adam and Eve, to the first pair of human beings or couple of human beings. That choice was very simple. It was the, the, the smallest possible test that God could give men. Mm-hmm. You know, obey in one simple command. You're going to be happy in everything else. You don't need anything of this. Just obey one simple command. Don't eat they, the forbidden fruit. Yes, they had to be put to the test. And unfortunately, we failed that test. And so all the evils that happened, they're not because God wanted them. They are because we chose that collectively as a gen, as, as, as a species. We chose that. And so we suffer that. But even then, God repaired that and God is using that evil to do good. So it's very important to understand, yes, God wants to do good to us. And it's only because we choose otherwise that we don't receive that good or because we don't perceive it as good, perhaps due to our mistakes and evil inclinations. Right. Now, the other point that is very important of God's love, and this is of, often overlooked, is God, God's justice. God's justice is part of love as well. And, you know, today in, 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 in the new modernist church, they preach a, a lot about saying, you know, God will never, will never punish. God will never punish anyone because he's so merciful and whatever. That would be a monstrous thing. That would be calling God unjust and it would be making God actually a tyrant. So imagine something, for example. Imagine that we lived in a society, and we are seeing it actually, where crime was not punished. Mm-hmm. Imagine that someone goes and rapes a young girl and he's not punished. And actually he gets all the same privileges that everyone else. Imagine that someone comes and murders your husband and leaves you alone. And now you have to take care of your children and you are bereft of your loved one. But he's mm-hmm. not punished. He's left doing whatever and he's actually receiving all the same privileges that you do. Imagine not only that, imagine how evil society would become if you had such things. This would be a, an absolute, uh, I don't know if I can use this word, but it would be an actual hell. Just by failing to uh, to execute justice. Exactly. So justice is actually a sign of love. You punish because you love. If you love society, you will punish the wicked. If you mm. love your family, if you love your children, you will punish them. Because that's how you teach them to be good and to make the right choices in life. If you leave your child be an evil ch- child and you don't punish him, that's not a sign of mercy. That's not a sign of love. That's a sign that you don't care. You don't care about him. You don't care about his health. You don't care about his life. So you don't punish him. So justice mm-hmm. is a very, very important part of love. And so hell, you know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, in the Divine Comedy the poem written by Dante. Mm -hmm. Is that how you say it in English, Dante? Dante, yes. Yeah. He puts on the the gates of hell, he puts these words, it was the first love that made me. And there is a lot of meanings to that. He actually puts a lot of meanings into that because he's talking both about the love, the self-love of -hmm. Satan, but he's also talking about the love of God, the Mm -hmm. love of justice. And so it's very important for us to remember, God has those two sides, but those are two sides of love, justice and mercy. And so in, in, the, ever, in the eternal life, in the life uh, that is to come, the evil people will be punished by justice. And that will be an act of love from God. Not to them, perhaps, but an act of love of God to the chosen ones, to the ones that were good and to God himself. And the good people will be rewarded. And that's also an act of love from God. An act of love for those who are who were good and an act of love again to God himself. And uh, we could even add something else. 
even those who will be punished in hell also receive some of God's mercy because their punishment could be and should be way more than it actually is. Mm. So even the even the punishment in hell is not as bad as it should be or could be because, uh, well, I don't want to go too long on this, but if you offended an infinite being, your punishment needs to be infinite. And even in hell, it's infinite in time or, you know, everlasting, we could say in time, but it's not infinite in, in, in intensity. So even then it's not as bad as it could be. So even be. though God is perfectly just and perfectly merciful, uh, the punishments that he doles out to the damned f swing more towards mercy than justice. He doesn't exercise absolute justice against them. I would say that there is perfect justice, but I would say that in that perfect justice, there is still God's mercy in a certain right. way. Right. So could it even be said that perfect justice is a merciful justice? Yes. Okay. That, that, that's how I would say it. Now, I hope I, I don't get any phone calls from some uh, <laughs> priests telling me, Father, what are you doing here? Uh, I've heard Sounds this reasonable before. to me. So th those are two sides of, of God's love. Uh, God's being just and God being merciful. Now, mm -hmm. The Catechism here tells us other two things. You know, it tells us about uh, a sin that is related to faith, to, to, excuse me, to hope, to the virtue of hope. Oh, I yes. Could, I could go to one extreme. I could think of God's justice, or I could forget of God's justice and say, oh, God is never going to punish me. God is never going to send me to hell. You know, I don't need to worry about being good because God is all good and merciful, and so he will never send me to hell. That would be what we call the sin of presumption, where you are presuming of God's mercy. So I and think that's that's a common line of thought for people today, right? Yes, and, and, and you're presuming of God's mercy unreasonably. You're mm -hmm. basically saying that God is unjust. And as we said, that would be a, a monstrous thing to, to think that God is going to allow you to be evil and he's not going to do anything about it. You're mm -hmm. basically saying that God doesn't love you or doesn't love humanity. That's not God. God is just and he loves us. And so, yes, he will punish our sins. The other extreme would be to forget God's mercy. To think, oh, you know, no matter what I do, I'll go to hell. No matter what I do, I cannot change. No matter what I do, I've committed so many sins, God's never going to forgive me. Mm -hmm. And that would be the sin of despair, of losing hope. And that's, you're forgetting there, the other side of God's love. And that's God's mercy. What's the middle of that of that term to understand that God will always help me to be better. God will always help me to get out of sin and to change. And that if I do what I what I have in my hands, if I do what God allows me and gives me the grace to do, I will be able to go to heaven. But if I reject God's mercy, if I reject God's graces and helps or aid then I will fall into God's justice. So it's very simple. If you're so good, could you look at it like this? Like uh, the standard that God sets is is always there and it's immutable and that's his justice. But then the helps he gives us and the forgiveness he gives us is his mercy or is a, uh, a comes from his mercy. Yes. Yes, that would be a, a good way to say it. So uh, that's what we cover in this chapter. We're covering the perfection of God, you know, the the characteristics of God. And I think it's very important to understand it and understand it properly. I think if we know how God is and who God is, we can love him as well. And this is a basic thing that we need to understand God's providence and God's action on the world. So that would be, I guess, all the comments that I have for this particular lesson. Well, this has been a fascinating chapter for me. It's uh, very interesting to hear all of these, um, all of this the stuff about God, it's uh, its very interesting. You're very theological, brother. I, I i fear sometimes when I'm in the show with you because I'm kind of here trembling with you. My knees are shaking against each other just thinking of the next question <laughs> you're going to ask me. <laughs> well, I'm glad I'm working with such a knowledgeable priest who can uh, supply the answers. It's, no, it's a real treat, actually. We'll see what happens when I get all those phone calls from the other <laughs> priests. <laughs> Just kidding. Well, yeah, that's that's all the comments I have. Okay. Well, I'll I'll t wrap us out then. Uh, thank you all for joining us.
for uh, another episode of What Every Catholic Should Know. Please uh, send your questions or remarks or comments using the forms on the website. This has been your host, Brother Alexius, joined by Father Carlos Cepeda, and you've been listening to The Catholic Wire. Thank you, brother. God bless you. <laughs> God bless you, Father. Thank you for listening to The Catholic Wire. If you have found this show helpful, please say a prayer for all our collaborators. Don't forget to subscribe to our channels and share with your friends. For questions and comments, you may contact us at thecatholicwire.org.